world changes. I just wanted to make a quick video to let you know I've just released my latest podcast episode with Professor John Peterson from Oberlin College. And the reason why I'm so excited to share this episode is because what he studies is what I am so interested in, which is how do people respond when they get to see their environmental impact displayed on the wall on a digital screen. And so what he studies is, well, how does it affect you just seeing the numbers? What happens if we add color? What happens if you can consciously see the screen and you respond to it? But also what happens if people unconsciously respond, meaning that the screen works even if you don't even notice it. Then what happens if you add in a character, like a cute animal that smiles when energy use is low and then frowns when energy use is high? And how can we use these type of systems in terms of displaying the impact of our whole city and how our schools and our buildings fit into that and then our own personal use into a whole systems thinking style of approach? Now, John Peterson is a wealth of knowledge and insight, and I really enjoyed doing this episode. And I hope you get a chance to listen to it, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the podcast at the link above. And uh, thanks for watching. Well, Katie, thank you so much for inviting me. I have to admit, I was not familiar with your work, and I did sort of peruse the stuff you've done, and it's extraordinarily impressive, your work, and has a frightening degree of overlap with my own work in many ways, so that's exciting, and I don't know quite how you found me, but I'm excited to share some of the work we've been doing, and I think I do kind of want to spend the next 10 minutes talking a little bit about this concept of environmental dashboard, which is kind of a culmination of a lot of different aspects of research on feedback that I've been involved in with but just to say a little bit more about my background, I am a systems ecologist, as Katie mentioned, and my background is I, I went to Oberlin College as an undergraduate and then got a degree in forest hydrology at Yale University and then went on to get my PhD in coastal marine ecology at University of Maryland, studying coastal ecosystems with the thought that that might keep me on the coast, which... I guess I, I'm on the coast of Lake Erie, not on, not on the coast I intended. But I guess my point is I started off very much as a natural scientist and got interested in feedback in complex systems. But over the last couple decades, my research has really shifted much more towards social science and trying to connect flows of energy with human behavior and seeing if feedback can't be a mechanism for motivating people to conserve resources. Environmental dashboard, like I say, is kind of a culmination of that. It's a technology and an approach that we've been developing for organizations and communities that combines real-time public display of resource use and environmental conditions with kind of the thoughts and actions that, uh, that community are engaging in, in ways that motivate, empower, and celebrate sustainable thought and action. And over the last decade, our research has been supported by lots of folks who I should mention, the US EPA, the Ohio EPA, the Great Lakes Protection Fund have been real supporters, the Cleveland Foundation right now. We also, in the early aughts, founded a company called Lucid Design, which went on to sort of commercialize some of what we developed. So some of what I'm gonna talk about is installed in thousands of buildings across the United States and Canada. But my own work has sort of remained very much focused on community. So this idea of a sort of community scale feedback is really quite central to what I've been trying to do. But the kind of central point I want to make as context for what I'm going to talk about is that for 99.9% .9 of the 50,000 years of of modern human evolution, the decisions that all of us made as individuals and as members of communities were really determined by direct and very intimate feedback we received from the ecological systems around us. So our ability to successfully acquire food, fuel, fiber, and shelter was really contingent on successfully responding to the cues around us. And you sort of fast forward to today, and the reality is that North Americans spend over 90% of our lives inside of buildings, and we've lost many of the feedback cues that informed our decision making. What we do in our daily lives as individuals and in communities is now very much separate from nature. And I think a case can be made that that's really kind of our fundamental problem, is we don't have the feedback that allowed us to calibrate what we did with the natural 
world around us. And I think many of these problems about lack of sustainability really relate to that loss of feedback. So it's not that feedback has disappeared. I mean, ecological systems are still dominated by feedback. Obviously, we're social organisms, so the way we engage with each other is dominated by feedback. And increasingly, we're developing very sophisticated feedback in our technological systems. But the problem is those three, those three sort of zones of feedback aren't really connected with each other anymore. So many of us have been kind of focused on this idea of trying to bring together uh, human beings, the sort of consequences of choices we make, on the natural environment and bringing that information back to human beings. I mean, I see that concept of what some people have called eco-feedback or what some of us call socio-technological feedback really all over the, the excellent work that Katie's doing, that idea of really trying to recouple us with the natural systems that we're dependent on. So we're more aware of the impact and can calibrate our decision-making accordingly. So kind of the fundamental question that I've been asking together with many of my, my colleagues is, are there ways we can leverage the power of integrated feedback and storytelling in ways that motivate and empower social, ecological, and economic transformation, the kind of transformation that's really necessary to address these you know, really fundamental existential challenges we're facing, like climate change. So in many ways, what we're trying to do is to develop a technology and an approach to communication that really promotes systems thinking and action. So a systems thinker is someone who sees themselves as an integrated and an important part of a larger whole that they're participating in. And there, there are kind of a bunch of corollaries to that. One is we're trying to develop this technology to foster a deeper sense of connectedness and belonging to social, ecological, and economic systems that people participate in. We're trying to really help people situate their individual decision-making in a much larger community context. We're trying to really share and celebrate the pro-environmental thought and behavior that people are already engaged in. And finally, at the end of the day, we are trying to change people's behavior in ways that directly advance sustainability and resilience. Kind of a conceptual model of this is using technology as a connector that joins together different entities within a community and then also allows for sort of the spontaneity of networking to develop in those. So just to get kind of specific about the technology we've been involved in developing, it's got kind of four components to it. One is something we call building dashboard, which is used to monitor and display resource use within the built environment. Think of it as being like the dashboard on your car, but for buildings and with a lot of social psychology built into it. Citywide dashboard, which monitors and displays resource use at the level of whole cities. Community Voices, which combines the images and words drawn from real people in communities. And then we also really see the value and importance of having some way for people to exchange information about what's going on within communities. And the main distribution venues for this are digital signage. So for instance, within the community of Oberlin, which is a small community, 6,000 people, we have 21 screens installed throughout, throughout the community. So you can't really walk through the community of Oberlin for more than about five minutes without, without walking by a screen that contains feedback about resource use in the community, about what people are doing to conserve resources. And obviously we have a web presence, but we do see this notion of putting information in people's face, in their space as being, that's kind of crass, but that's kind of what we see as critical to making this feedback evident to everyone within a community. So it's kind of a multi-level feedback concept where we recognize people are making choices. Those choices are affecting the environment. The environment is affecting community. And we're beginning to install metering then to measure the impact of those choices, translate those into a display that's engaging and empowering to a non-technical audience. That was sort of where we started with building dashboard within buildings. Then we began building in monitoring. So that's our first level of feedback. Then we began building in monitoring of environmental conditions with, within our local community and including that as part of the display. And then finally adding in the sort of choices that people are making as a sort of 
additional level of display within this. So this, what I have in front of you, is a screenshot video of our building dashboard. Lots of components I could talk about, but I think one of the ones that has been most important that, and that we've done quite a bit of research on is that character on, that, on the right. So that character exhibits different behavior. We call it an empathetic character, and it exhibits different behavior depending on your level of resource use. So it'll basically animate resource flows that have occurred over a time period. And you can see the squirrel's happy. That's Flash the Energy Squirrel, happy when resource use is low and gets sad when resource use is high. And it has a bunch of different behaviors that it can exhibit. And I could give a whole talk on Flash and We've done quite a bit of research, some really exciting research in our public schools that kind of demonstrates we've kind of rewired our kids. When energy use is high in our schools, our kids actually feel sad, which is, which is pretty amazing. We've compared it with other public schools where there's like no emotional response whatsoever. And the, the character, again, I could talk about the character quite a bit, but it has lots of different behaviors and storytelling modes it can go into, and, but it goes into all sorts of different, different behaviors that are, about things that one can do to conserve resources. So you're seeing various pro-environmental behavior here, and then the squirrel's gonna be really excited about that. So that's one level of feedback. The other technology that we've been working really hard on and beginning to develop for other communities is called Citywide Dashboard. So this is an animated display of resource use. It kind of addresses the fact that most people have no idea where their electricity is coming from, where their water's coming from, what happens when they flush the toilet. They really are not aware of how their actions within their workplace or within their home are affecting the larger community that they're part of. So we've kind of tried to translate a community into a cartoon of a community and then animate that community with resource flows. So this is an example of one of the visualizations you'd see on screens within Oberlin. Again, it's sort of showing where your water's coming from, where your electricity is coming from, the, the sort of dominant businesses and organizations within a community, green spaces. The gauges on the right are real-time displays of total community real resource use. So we have tapped into our local power plant, into our water treatment facility. Uh, we have gauges within the river system and all of those can be displayed and the character will deliver different messages depending on current levels of resource consumption or environmental conditions within the community. So you're seeing electrons flowing down power lines. The rate at which those electrons go down the power lines is directly proportional to electricity use and you can see there's a CO2 emission gauge. So I actually very much agree with Katie's point that I think people are actually oftentimes more motivated by CO2 than they are by kilowatt hours or dollars. I, I think that actually we've studied that, it's true. So we have another character, a fish character, Wally Walleye, which again exhibits different be behavior depending on your level of water use within communities. Again, you can see the water flowing through the community and that what those water flows are proportional to the actual rates of water consumption within our city. There's also stuff on water quality within our, we have monitoring equipment installed in our local river system. So people begin to develop that connection. This third component that I'll mention is a combination of images and words drawn from community members, uh, several different categories of content. And again, this is really to sort of try to build social norms around uh, pro-environmental and pro-community behavior. So we have hundreds and hundreds of different images and combinations of images and words that we use to sort of feature the positive work that people are already doing in the community, trying to essentially ratchet up social norms so that people feel like, hey, this is what our community does. That was wonderful, John. Thank you for explaining it. So one question I like to start everybody on, you may have already explained it, but I love to hear people explain it in their own words is, what is the problem with the world when all this stuff is missing? I personally feel in the environmental movement, I've been in sustainability for 20 years, and I have not seen feedback loops and real-time data being at the forefront of sustainability thinking in all this time. I had to kind of figure it out on my own. Looking at kind of like Fitbits and other models of, of what people were doing in Silicon Valley and kind of like coming back and finding it. How is the environmental movement and people and anyone trying to create change hamstrung when they're not taking feedback loops and data design and how that links into social norms and behavioral psychology. What's the problem when that's a dark abyss that people don't understand? 
Well, I guess I go back to the point I made about human evolution, which is that we evolved not just as social organisms with each other, but as social organisms that were fundamentally integrated within larger ecosystems. And the, the problem is that development of fossil fuels, the movement towards cities, the sort of movement out of natural ecosystems and into these very artificial environments, you know, we're living in buildings that are typically temperature controlled. We're not experiencing that feedback from nature. And I do feel like that's a fundamental limitation to our ability to address problems. And you could say on one hand that technology has to some extent created this situation where we can produce lots of food with very few farmers and live very separate from nature. But I think actually at this particular moment in our history when climate change is obviously this existential crisis we're facing, technology also allows us to sense the environment at scales that our ancestors could not sense. So I do feel like we're at this almost singular moment in our history where we desperately need feedback to recalibrate our activities so that they are they can be supported by you know natural flows of energy from sunlight and where all materials are recycled the concept of waste is eliminated and i feel like technology actually provides us with the capacity to sense global scale change in a way that obviously our ancestors probably didn't need to worry about but we really absolutely do need to worry about and do you feel that the environmental and the practical sustainability movement needs to start taking the technology of sensing this data a lot more seriously? I do. I feel like obviously scientists have really advanced sensing technology enormously, but I feel like the work that you're doing, hopefully the work that I'm doing of translating that information into a form that's actually accessible and emotionally resonant as well as informational for a non-technical public is really the crucial work that is just in its infancy right now. I mean, you know, the beautiful visualizations that NASA creates and stuff, they're still, let's face it, they're really geeky. They're not, they're not designed to really pry people's emotional response. And I think at the end of the day, these sort of like emotional responses, the heuristic responses of human beings, not the informational responses, are what really drives us in most of our decision making. One of the first things you said is the focus on the animal, right? We just, I have the, all these designs for this next generation of energy lollipop that we're going to use. And I've put an animal in all of it. And I have a four-year-old girl and she has like 30 different iPhone games on her phone. Like every game you can get, she's downloaded. And one thing I notice is that they often have like an egg and an animal that like hatches. Like something about kids and eggs hatching. They're crazy about it. So I designed this egg hatching into it. And I'm like, people are going to love it. People are going to love the egg. They have to turn the energy down to get the egg to hatch. I'm like, if my two-year-old loves it or three-year-old um, but then I found one of the in one of the references of your studies it talked about this um, mechanical cat and it said that the mechanical cat got better results than just showing feedback which is basically numbers and you've got your animal there you said you can keep talking about the animal I mean I just think it's super fun people are talking about all this serious stuff like policy and how to show numbers how can we use basically cute animals Empathetic character gauges is what we call them. Like they're designed to promote empathy, right? That's actually their function is to, is to sort of bypass the, I don't know, higher level of sort of logical thought and hit straight on, on the emotional thinking. But I think there's actually a few reasons why animals are good. One thing is obviously they're kind of an analog for children. You know, we're choosing to design organisms that have really big eyes. And so I think they, they stir the same emotions of sort of wanting to care for something that needs to be cared for. But we've actually found a really, a really important secondary value of using animals, which is that as soon as you start using people or people characters, you get into issues of, of what particular race are you representing or what particular gender are you representing. And the animals actually allow you to sort of bypass that whole issue because everyone can sort of identify with a cuddly furry animal. Whereas as soon as you start showing actual images of human beings, you get into, you get into these issues of who are you representing and who are you not representing. So they've got this whole other value that we've kind of discovered. Well, I think also you can have people choose their own races and genders and all of that, but that's a much harder thing to build in. And I think we do have a unique empathy for animals that maybe we don't have for people. Like not everyone likes children. <laughs> <laughs> not even people like people, but we all kind of like animals. We've got a question here from Pundrick. What's your advice on how would people go about getting owners of the utilities and bowlings to install these sensors and essentially sign up to the, to the program? 
Yeah, well, that's partly why we we founded Lucid Design back in in 2004 was to create, you know, we had been working on this stuff for four years in Oberlin and there were a lot of architects coming around saying, hey, we want this in our building and we'd have to say to them, it's just sort of an experimental thing. So we developed this company to to make it product for other people. Unfortunately, that, that company ended up and, and it sold a couple of years ago, so I don't have anything to do with it anymore. We still need to make it more cost effective, frankly. Lucid's product is very expensive right now to install in buildings. And I just started a new company in May of last year called Community Hub that we're trying to create something that's more affordable and also that has more of an emphasis. Lucid ended up focusing mostly on the commercial real estate market in the end. And I really want a community-based technology that is affordable to communities. So at this point, we're redeveloping a lot of the software for doing that. We have some clients in Cleveland and Toledo, but it's still kind of at a pilot stage right now. But, But stay tuned. We hope to make it easily accessible and affordable. I mean, there's a huge market of people selling these type of softwares to utilities and to building managers. I mean, I haven't done that job myself. I'm sort of on, but I'm around that community and it's a very established industry. They're putting up RFPs for consultants and technology companies to work with utilities. John Kelly has got a question. So do animals also solve the problem of lag in the system? I'm suggesting that they do because people will hang out longer watching an animal than a delayed moving needle. It's a really interesting point. I appreciated the real timeness of your Oberlin systems. I mean, uh, we have sort of basically a minute lag in most of our most of our data. The character, I think, is much more engaging, and we've done some research comparing. Well, we developed a technology called the Environmental Orb back in 2006, which is installed in all of our dormitories at Oberlin, which glows different colors depending on on resource use. And we did an early study where we compared a needle gauge with an orb gauge with an empathetic character gauge. And we actually found that people were less interested in the needle gauge. They liked both the orb gauge and the empathetic character gauge more. They were most interested in the empathetic character gauge. So we've tried a bunch of different comparing sort of ambient feedback technologies with sort of more traditional analogs of a speedometer in a car. People do find these these other approaches more interesting than a, than a needle. Yeah, I find I don't really have academic research for my stuff. I only really have the Twitter sphere for how many people like click like on what I do. But I do find anything that's circular. That's why we designed the lollipop as a circle with a color. People seem to really love that look, and it kind of looks like a lollipop versus other types of design. I found that to be more the most popular of all the stuff I've put out there. My next question is, one of the studies that you sent me about the competitions, energy saving competitions in college campuses got an enormous amount of energy saving. The highest got 56%, with the average being 32%. So just to put this into context for everybody, energy saving efforts from utilities and organizations tend to be, and even the technology tends to be around the maybe three to 10%. That's when it's studied. I think in the real world, it's even smaller than that, like 2%. It's tiny, right? So John, how did you get your competition to be so successful? And what can we learn from that to try and get upwards of 50% energy saving from people? That's the most cited paper I've ever I've ever published uh, because it, it was kind of an exciting finding. So for many years, we ran resource reduction competitions in at Oberlin and then in the public schools. And then we ran something for a number of years called Campus Conservation Nationals, which occurred on campuses across the United States in which you had dormitories competing with each other to see who could reduce their electricity and water use by the largest percentage. In this study you're you're referencing there, that was when we first began to develop real-time feedback. And in that study, we were comparing dorms that had real-time feedback for the competition and those that did not. It was kind of exciting to watch watch how it transformed student behavior Uh, So there were two dorms that had the real-time feedback, and they basically blew everyone else out of the water. There are a bunch of interesting things that didn't end up in that paper. One is that we had these sort of old Macintosh computers that we were using as our displays in those dorms. And in one of those dorms, they started to unplug our display. And, And we got really angry with them and said, why are you unplugging the display? And they said, well, we basically have been watching the feedback. We learned how to conserve resources, and we don't want your damn screen sucking down electricity in our in our dorm anymore so we had to threaten to just oh, that was like hyper successful 
the literature on building says that basically a maximum of, of about 50% of your electricity use is actually discretional and the rest is mostly in mechanical systems that you know you don't really control have control over but what students were doing in those dorms where they were unplugging vending machines and disabling hallway lights which got our facilities people very angry with us because we were violating fire code and whatnot and I had to pretend that I was really upset, but actually I was incredibly psyched that these students were doing it because I felt like they'd been going through their lives, walking by these electricity consumption devices and never really noticing it. And suddenly giving them the feedback was almost like putting glasses on. And I know you actually, you have this technology on your website that you've described of sort of these glasses that sort of visualize the possible future but it was kind of like that i felt like where students were seeing for the first time energy consumption that they just never seen before and you know taking these radical measures in response to being able to observe what they'd never seen before i will say we've never produced we've never reproduced that level of resource use i think part of it was the novelty we did especially within our k-12 schools regularly get 30% reductions within competitions. But of course that trails off afterwards at the end. So you get that during like a two week competition and then afterwards it sort of trails off. But one of the things we have documented is it does stay lower for the remainder of the year after the competition. So, so people have learned things that they continue to exhibit, but they don't continue doing things like disabling hallway lights and unplugging vending machines. But nevertheless, I think for most of those students, they experience this novel understanding of energy and their capacity to control energy that they'd never really experienced before. And I think that was quite a deeply empowering lesson for them. And do you think it was the feedback itself or the comparison between other dorms that was the driver? That's a really good question. I think that feedback in, I think social norms, that, you know, I, I, my closest colleague here at Oberlin is Cindy French, she's a social psychologist. And I have really come to believe that it is social norms that really are the key to behavior change. It's making data comparative with others who you care about or are some sort of reference to you. So yeah, I think whether it's competition or other forms of social norms, I think seeing how you're doing relative to other people and constructing through technology an environment in which you're motivated to beat them in some way. I mean, you know, some sort of friendly competition. Although I will say we did several years, we collaborated with USGBC and with the World Wildlife Fund on this campus conservation, this competition. And the first time we did it, we had campuses competing with each other. And that turned out to be really disempowering because of course there's only a couple campuses that are going to win and then there's 50 campuses that are not going to do as well. And so we found that level of competition was really disempowering. And so in the subsequent years, we had competitions within campuses and then collaboration among campuses. So we set like a goal of reducing electricity by a gigawatt hour across all campuses, which we actually did. Uh, but then within campuses, we had competition. So I think, I think considering the scales at which you're engaging people in competition versus collaboration, I, I learned the lesson that that's actually a really important thing to think about when, because if only a few people can win and you have a lot of people participating, competition is actually really disempowering. You know what I'm saying? So you have to think really carefully about how you build in that social comparison in a way that empowers people rather than disempowers people. That's come up a few times. Like if you have like a leaderboard and you know, like only one person really gets to be first right. or second, right. everyone else is kind of depressed by it and they don't get to see progress. So you need to, I mean, I'm a, as a user interface designer, I think, well, I have to not design like that. You need to chop it up into like, maybe just putting like, I don't know, like groups of like three people together. So that's they're closer together, showing yeah. each individual's progress, you know, with, with, with a goal, just being aware of that. You want to use technology to construct the appropriate groups. So if you can group people into scenarios in which, in which they're, they're near enough that they feel motivated. But I think a lot of thought needs to go into that piece of the design process, how you construct groups. And, you know, at the end of the day, obviously, we sink or swim together as a species. Whenever you do competition, I think it wants to be embedded in, in a larger collaborative context. My next question is about understanding the role of education. I feel like 
pretty much everybody who works in sustainability and environmental change makes the value action gap. My book opens up, it's like the first page is about the value action gap in the first sentence. However, some education works as a primer, this word I learned, it works as a primer. So when you do put the behavioral prompt, so the screen, the feedback, the competition, the emotive co-learner gauge animal, people are more receptive. They're kind of ready to go. How important is the education? Can we just like get away with kind of not doing it at all? Just move straight to like data and behavior? Or should we be, if we're planning something, plan to, okay, get everyone to watch a documentary, you know, then get everyone to watch some YouTube videos. Okay, now they're really psyched. Now we put the intervention in there. Or can we just kind of like let it go and just assume people's ambient environmental education is just, just enough? There's a lot in that question. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm an educator, so I guess I'm sort of biased. I didn't say how I make my money, but I make the money I make as a college professor mostly. I think education is critical, but I guess also it's a question of how you're defining education. I mean, I think the information we're putting on screens, I think the behavior of the squirrel is education. I mean, I think it's all education, but as you're referencing here, there is a major gap. I mean, I think it used to be, and I think you know, this is written all over the failure of, of addressing climate change, that we assumed that if people knew enough, they would act. I mean, that was always what climate science was about, was, well, if, pe if we just got more evidence, if we just convinced people that this was really occurring and had them understand the magnitude of what's going on, they would then take political action. And I think we've come to understand that information alone is not what motivates people. Understanding alone is not what motivates people. And so I think figuring out, obviously, you have to have a level of understanding before you'll be motivated to act, but that's not actually what motivates you. So I think there's an enormous amount of complexity that, that we have yet to really figure out, to be honest. I think there's enormous room for folks like you and me and others to try to crack this nut of, you know, what is the right combination of information and then emotional uh, generating initiative. I suppose the way I think about it in terms of a, an academic context is that if I've got 100 people, right, say you're, you're doing a study, right, you've got 100 people in one group and 100 people in another group. If one group, we get to watch a documentary about climate change, you know, it's, it's typical education or see a lecture, and the other group, we don't, and then we give them all of the energy saving prompts, how much better will the one who watched the documentary do? Or will it make no difference? I see all these things where it doesn't make any difference. Like apparently people who really care about climate change and know a lot all about it don't do any better at saving energy than people who don't believe in climate change and vote for Trump. I mean, I don't know if that's completely true, but I believe that I have read that in abstracts of papers. It's like, well, what's the point? Crying on Twitter about the earth burning, but there's really in the data, like not that, that different. So that's my question. With the two groups of the 100 people, how, how much better would the one who saw the documentary do? I actually think it depends on the nature of the documentary. I mean, I think what you're saying is, that is actually supported by data that, that knowledge, again, it's a kind of a reiteration of something I was saying, knowledge does not, does not necessarily breed action, even knowledge among people who care. Again, I got, kind of go back to this idea of systems thinking. This is one of the centers of our research right now, trying to get people to see themselves within a larger whole and understand the importance of their decision making is kind of fundamental to what we're trying to do, but it's still not a fully tested hypothesis. This notion that people who think systemically necessarily make better choices is not a fully tested hypothesis, but I do think context is critical. And I think social context is particularly critical but obviously political context is critical as well. I mean, you know, I don't know if Europeans as a whole are fundamentally more moral or behave better than we do, but the reality is they use a lot less resources than those of us in North America. And the reason they use less resources, I think, is probably largely because of political constraints. You know, they recycle more because they're forced to recycle more. You know, they have legislation that compels them to do that. And I think there is a ratcheting between social behavior and actual context that forces people to do things. Um, we've got a question from Madeline Wisecup. Would you like to ask your question, Madeline? I worked as a head producer for the Navy's U.S. Energy Security Campaign. And what I found when we would go onto the ships, but when we would go on board the ships, if the, say, the CO was super on board with reducing energy conservation, trying to reduce their fuel intake, 
the whole ship would just get on board. They would all get rallied behind the CO and they would do really well in the competition because the Navy at one point was doing that. If the CO couldn't give a rat's blank about energy conservation, didn't you know make it a priority, nobody on the ship made it a priority. So they got me thinking like, how do you get people to care? And that's one of the reasons I had reached out to Katie because I really love what she's doing. How do you get a huge group? And you know, we were working for the Navy at this point, talking about pilots or talking about Marines who are using fuel, you know, to, for their livelihoods. So how do you get people like that to care to make a change? I think that's a, just a powerful example of using social norms, the more you can use an example. John? Yeah, I mean, uh, you brought up a couple things there, Madeline. One is the issue of leadership. And I think mm-hmm. obviously there are certain structures like the U.S. military where leadership is so, is, is so fundamental to the organizational structure. I think in those contexts, you know, leadership is absolutely crucial, even within our country. I mean, obviously, that what what our president is is doing and saying is is um, is pretty critical in terms of establishing leadership. Uh, but but the but the storytelling component that you're talking mm. about there, I think, is also important. Telling the right stories. If I've learned anything from psychology and anthropology, it's social norms and storytelling. The power of you know using technology to tell a story that helps people to, to see themselves as part of a po- positive larger whole, part of a community that is moving forward on things. And I, I also think that sort of positive element of stories is very important. I mean, negative stories obviously are very important. They're used, you know, negative campaigns are very p- powerful in political situations. But I think at the end of the day, most positive action results from inspirational stories about what has been done and what can be done. So I think finding ways of using technology to tell those positive stories and ratchet up people's behavior is is just critical to successful design. The next one is the granularity and resolution of data. We can do it at a whole bunch of levels of the individual home, of the block, of the street, and then also the granularity of time. Is it absolutely real time to the second? Is it every five minutes, every 15 minutes, every hour? Nico and I, who's on the call now, have been looking at the electricity APIs, and some of them have every 15 minutes with PG&E, but I looked up some others, and they only come every hour. And I'm wondering, gee, if it's really every hour, are we going to get the real-timeness enough? Using the word granularity, how granular does it need to be, both time-wise and both kind of geospatially, before the impact starts to drop off? I think that's a really good question, and I think it's quite context dependent. If you're looking at a whole city, I mean, we do happen to have minute resolution data, and it's exciting to be able to see, you know, in Oberlin, you can see when there's a fire going on, for instance, because water use is spiking uh, when the fire department is responding to something. And I think that that level of connection that people feel about, oh, what's happening at that sort of individual level really is affecting city use. But the fact is, when you start looking at whole communities, People's individual actions are kind of sort of subsumed in the average. As as you increase spatial scale, time resolution becomes, I think, somewhat less important. But it really is so context dependent. So right now, I'm working on uh, building a new school in our community. And it gives me the opportunity to work with the designers to really disaggregate end uses by, for instance, classrooms. So we'll be able to separate out the first graders from the second graders from the third graders in terms of resource use. And I think that's going to be very powerful for their learning to be able to see like their individual actions, you know, when they turn off lights, being able to see that on our display. But but I think, it, you know, if you're doing a competition between a bunch of different dorms and stuff, the minute resolution is really important for helping people to understand how behaviors affect things. But I think the motivation is probably slightly larger scale. So I just, it's so context dependent. For me, it's sort of partly opportunistic. At what level can I get data? You know, I'm always trying to get the finest, most disaggregated, the finest grain, most disaggregated data, but give me any data and I think I can do something useful with it. So I think being opportunistic with what exists, I mean, we've we've discovered that there's all this data from buoys that are installed out in Lake Erie and in river systems that agencies have been collecting, but it's, and it's on the internet in the really Byzantine form, no, no decent display. So there's a lot of data out there to be had, and I feel like before we worry too much about collecting more data, we should probably take advantage of what we have and just figure out what what can we do with it, you know? 
Yeah, that's interesting. Like at least get it out there what's looking nice before we worry about the, the frequency. My next question is about wall-mounted screens. I'm obsessed with wall-mounted screens. I want to cover the world with environmental data wall-mounted screens. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, and it, people always say, you know, like, oh, why don't you make it into a website? Why don't you make an app? Like, why don't you make a, a Facebook widget or whatever? Um, the, the question is, I mean, I think that wall-mounted screens, if they're designed well, will work. How well do they work versus, you know, this kind of what's called like ambient messaging versus if you don't have it and you're using things like email and text message and sort of Twitter bots to get out to people? Do we need I, the wall-mounted screens as much as I think I would like to, as much as I would like to design them? I believe you are 100% correct. I use the, the phrase before, in your face, in your space. Because the, the reality behind a website, you know, honestly, this was one of our motivations for doing competitions is we created this beautiful display. We had it online. The only people looking at it were the people who were already there, you know, who already were mentally there. You know, they wanted to look at it because they were interested in it, but most people never looked at it. They wouldn't have gone there. They wouldn't have gone out of their way. You go to a website because you're already interested in something. Whereas if you've got a screen in your face, you're going you're gonna to deal with it, even if you don't think you're taking it in. So we've done quite a bit of research before we installed the screens in the community, and then three years after we installed the screens in the community. And we asked people a couple different questions. One is, how much do you notice the screens? And most people don't think that they're looking at the screens. But then you measure like things like, how aware are you of where your electricity comes from or your water comes from? And that went way up as a result of having the screen. So they don't know they're getting the information, but they are getting the information. You ask them questions about the kind of content we have on Community Voices, like are kids moving us forward on the environment? Before the screens are there, it's lower than after the screens. Why? Because we're featuring all this stuff that kids are doing in our community. So they don't know they're taking in the information. So I think even if you encounter people who say, I don't look at screens, you know, it's like any other advertising. People don't think that they're taking it in, but they're taking it all in. I think ambient feedback is absolutely, absolutely critical because that's where you preach to the people who are not already there with you. Yeah, I think I saw on one study that was referenced in your studies that just using a light, they tested the subconscious or subliminal effect of light, that even if the light was just sort of, I can't remember it exactly, but it was like responding to something. But then they did another thing where they tested an emoji. One slither of time was so fast that you couldn't consciously tell that you got an emoji for saving energy. And then they tested it against the emoji where it was like a whole second, you could really, or half a second, you could really see the emoji. And they found that the unconscious emoji that was flashed so short and the light that was so short that you couldn't even see it worked almost just as well as consciously seeing the emoji. Or, and that's something which is about like lights in the background that weren't not really telling you what to do, but just the lights there had this effect on saving energy. So anyway, it's amazing to think that there's this unconscious message that goes on if we build these ambient systems. If you ask people if they noticed it, they'd just be like, I didn't notice anything, but yet the data is changing. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And I, again, I don't think there's no, there's no one solution. I think you need to give people information that takes some processing, but you also need to give people information that doesn't take processing. I don't think it's, it's not an either or. People need to be educated so that they have a deep understanding of these challenges we face. But the information you give them to actually change their behavior once they have some level of, of knowledge may be more effective if it's if it's ambient or if it's a, if, if it's about emotion so i feel like we need full spectrum solutions in terms of of how we engage educate motivate and empower people to make positive change i don't think there's a solution but i i personally feel like you need ambient feedback and to get a bit more specific about that if you can design something with the net amount of matter kilowatts or parts per million of pollution, water, whatever, or you can design it in 100%. And then you get to see, oh, we saved like 10% or 15% instead of we saved like the raw number. I think in your competition, you used 100% and their job was to get down from 100%. Which one would you prefer to use, net numbers or percent? Oh, definitely percent. Although I think they have different functions, like on the citywide dashboard where we have those numbers on the right that are changing all the time, showing you real-time conditions. I don't really care whether people actually grasp those numbers and know, oh, we're using, you know, 50,000 gallons of water per hour. 
right now. But I think just having the numbers there and the numbers moving gives people this sense that this is a community that like the community is using water. So I think there are a couple different reasons to use numbers. One is because you actually want people to know what the numbers are. I, don't, I have a terrible memory for numbers and I think most people do, but knowing that there are numbers, you know, knowing that something is increasing is important. So I, I think numbers have different, different value for different purposes, but I agree with you that, you know, you know, percentages are something that you can pretty easily interpret. So our competitions are always about you know, a baseline and then what are you doing, what have you done since the competition started relative to the baseline? As you said at the start, people do not understand what a kilowatt hour is. I think for most of them, it's not that damn important that they do understand what a kilowatt hour is. What we want them <clears throat> is to reduce their energy use, right? Well, I've gotten over that by applying a color grade that I want to try and educate everybody on what the color means. Red means bad, dark red means really bad. So that's essentially kind of like the, the scale. Um, but we've got a question from Jordan about baseball. This fascinating conversation, this really interesting information. And I have a somewhat unusual situation. I've been talking to the Oakland Athletics uh, baseball team about taking their new ballpark to really high building performance standards. And what came up in the conversation was how can we get fans in, more involved with uh, sustainability and climate change, quite frankly, and, and how they can address it. Most of you know baseball games are really long. I think there's an opportunity there, and I, it's a sort of a new concept for me to consider how to engage 10 to 30,000 fans at a baseball game on something like water savings or energy efficiency or, or what their, their ballpark is doing to fight climate change and I just I wanted to ask John or you Katie whether you've got some just general ideas of how I might approach this with uh, Oakland Athletics and, and maybe try to start a trend throughout um, the baseball community. Well it's interesting you should mention that because we've been in discussion with the sustainability coordinator for the Cleveland Indian Stadium about, um, about how we might leverage what we're doing We've got an exhibit at the Great Lakes Science Center, which is kind of adjacent to their, to the to the Indians Stadium. And actually, the the um, owner of the Indians has donated money to our to support our project. So there's interest there. I don't know the mentality of sports fans well enough to have a clear sense of necessarily how you motivate them, but. I am intrigued about the capacity of using their digital signage because, of course, that's enormous digital signage. Yeah. And the question of, are you flashing messages, conservation messages on there? You know, what if you put citywide dashboard on there and you've got like your entire fan stadium? And Lord knows there's a lot of downtime in a baseball game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there for, for leveraging this sort of technology and taking advantage of what they got. What if they were looking at sort of citywide environmental conditions while they were at a baseball game? So I think there's huge opportunity there to be exploited, I would say. I never thought of that before, because you know, obviously I've never been to a sport game in my life that they have big um, screens. Okay, my next question, John, is getting into the nuances of how to design these energy saving competitions. If you had the choice between giving people a prize, so what do you call it, an extrinsic reward, or Comparing people to each other in that social competition thing, which one do you think is a stronger pull? How um, I compare to my neighbors that I get to do better than them or that I get like a thing? Well, this, this kind of goes a little bit back to your initial comment about money and whether money is like ultimately motivated to, to people. Because I think we certainly operate with this assumption that, you know, people are fundamentally economic entities and their primary motivation is, is either saving money we're making money. And I think, yeah, obviously money is a motivating factor for people. But I think the social factors of sort of wanting to belong, wanting to feel part of something are much more motivating. We found something really interesting with some of our early competitions, which was we would host ice cream parties for the dormitory that, that won. They would fight like cats to win, but then they wouldn't show up for the party. They didn't, they did not, they like wanted to have won the, the party, but they didn't actually care that much about it so it's a complicated thing like i think sometimes having an extrinsic factor kind of like makes people want to engage in the competition but it might not actually be the thing that's causing them to compete it's more of a social thing to compete so again i think there's a lot of complexity there and i don't i don't really know the answer but i think at the end of the day people care about other people more than they care about anything 
else, you know, whether it's money or some other extrinsic prize. But, you know, think of like these amusement parks where people will go and lay all these money, all this money down for these like worthless big animals that they will get or whatever they get. They'll just like put all sorts of like, you know, they'll compete like heck to get that thing, but they don't really want that thing. They just want to win, you know? I wonder if it's got to do with like the pursuit of mastery, like in game design, we had a sort of an eminent game design author on last month. And we talked about this quest of mastery. You know, people always say to me about environmental behaviors, they say, oh, it has to save the money and it has to be easy. And I'm just really not convinced Mm. by those arguments that people do a lot of extremely complicated things with their lives because we love the quest of mastery. And I wonder how much of that plays into the quest for the prize to kind of like master the competition. And I saw another somewhere in your studies, it said that complicated energy saving measures can do better than simple ones because people find simple ones kind of boring. Like people don't really get into switching the lights off, but it's quite possible that you could make the more substantial job of kind of like reworking an existing building, which is difficult to do into this like quest of mastery. And then the kind of like prize is more like about the quest rather than the tangible nature of the prize. I think one of the great failures of the environmental movement as a whole has been this sort of operating assumption that environmental actions need to be simple and easy in order to motivate people to do things. The sort of, you know, many 101 simple things you can do to save the environment. First of all, I think they're totally miscalibrated to the scale of the challenge. But secondly, I think that's not motivating for people. The analogies we want to use are more along the lines of Kennedy's speech about why do we go to the moon or Churchill's speeches about, you know, motivating the the English people to fight in World War II. It's, that's the scale of the problem. And I think people will rise to the level. If you tell people you can do five simple things and save the environment, you know, maybe they'll do those five simple things but that's what they'll do then. You know, I think we, we give people this false idea that solving our environmental problems can be easy. That's, that's not true. It's actually going to be a lot of work, but it could be really gratifying work. It could make all of us happier people if we eliminated the, the, you know, the consumer society. You know, I think, I think that the, the, the consumer society itself sort of pushes us towards thinking, well, it's all about, it's all about the nature of, you know, us as consumers, as opposed to these sort of larger engaging meaningfully with community, which is, I think, ultimately what we need to sort of move our technologies to do to get people to recognize, um, you know, community as opposed to simply saying, well, I'm going to buy some different stuff and everything's going to be okay. I think there's something really big in that pursuit of grand challenges and mastery that really hasn't been tapped into in the environmental movement as much as it can be. I've got a friend called uh, Tito who works on carbon engineering, carbon tech, whatever they call it now. We live in this Silicon Valley startup community. It's not hard to argue that Silicon Valley and the Bay Area is a magnet for the highest technical IQ people in the world. I mean, they're everywhere. Programmers, people with PhDs and every type of machine learning, whatever. And I don't feel that that vast community, and I've been living in here in this community for seven years now, is really following the epic challenge of re-engineering, the sustainability, the kind of earth cybernetic ecology re-engineering of the planet, and are focused on often, or what I perceive to be, sometimes they're interesting problems, but often very uninteresting problems, you know, like little widgets and websites, or like my friends putting like spit in a capsule and sending it to the moon, just in case aliens in the future (laughs) want to kind of get some DNA, and I'm just like... It's like very, very smart, accomplished guy doing something that I think is completely silly. Yeah, by trying to always like dumb down sustainability, we're not tapping into, or with the fear mongering as well, we're not tapping into the epic quest. And a lot of, I mean, not everyone is super technically capable, but a lot of people are. A lot of people are, and I don't think they're really, really tapping into that, you know, that, that pursuit of mastery instead of pursuit of like five green things you can do today, you know? Yeah, I, I agree with that. One of the things you also mentioned um, in the study was a commitment widget, which I think is really interesting going into the concept of pledges, just asking people for a promise, I think is this completely bold mine of easy low hanging fruit behavior that nobody's doing. So can you just explain a little bit what the commitment widget was and how you did it and how we could, could we build them? Can we all build commitment widgets? Well, one of the uh, basic principles of, of social psychology is that people are much more likely to do something if they've made a commitment and even more so if they make a public commitment to that thing. 
So if you generate a mechanism by which people can commit and publicly commit, you know, that's a very powerful way of motivating behavior change. So I think it's, a, it's another sort of thing we should be thinking about building, we should think about building into our design. It's actually one of our strategies behind Community Voices is that we interview a lot of different people in a lot of different contexts in our community. And many times they'll start the interview by saying, well, I'm not really an environmentalist. And then you'll talk with them for five minutes and discover that there are you know, six or seven things they're doing in their life, which are very pro-environmental. And then you feature that content. And by sort of featuring what they've mentioned, it sort of reinforces their identity as someone who actually is an environmentalist, even though they didn't come into it with that. And it's in some ways, it's a kind of a commitment where you sort of learn what people are doing, share what they're doing that's positive, and that reinforces their identity as that positive thing being part of who they are, and then they will sort of up and leverage that further. So I think there are a bunch of different contexts in which you can essentially get people who might not even see themselves as being in a position to commit to essentially commit to doing something, either by identifying what they're already doing or by saying, I, I will do this. But in a larger sense, I think oftentimes we don't ask people to do things. And if we simply ask them to do those things, they would do those things. You know, we're not as a society asking very much of people. And if we asked people, they would rise to the occasion. I find it remarkably powerful. I started, when I first learned about it, whenever I went to parties and meetups, and there's events all the time in San Francisco, so I'm out every second night go to potlucks or meetups or whatever. And I'd talk to people like, what do I was doing? And I'd be like, yeah, this thing really works. Could I just get you to write down something that you'd want to do? And then they would write down like, I commit to making my own toothpaste or I commit to buying a soda stream. And it was so powerful. A couple of times I stopped doing it because I felt like I made the person uncomfortable because they felt like, so they did it. And then they were like, oh my God, I have to buy one. And now I, but even in uh, meetup groups I've done, when I, and I take a photo of them, people start sending me like photos like a week later not because I'm asking they're like Katie like I'm still doing I met one guy and he's like I'm still making my own toothpaste like a year later and I'm like wow like I couldn't even remember the guy's name like it's so powerful and something that um we're not doing but with your commitment widget did you was it something on the internet did someone have to type it in I'm wondering if when somebody has to type it in it doesn't work anymore versus writing it down on a piece of paper with a real human there we had a mechanism where people could basically check things off that they were that they were doing. There is a large body of psychological research on commitment, so I think we might not have felt like we needed to go back and verify that because there is it's there have been plenty of studies that demonstrate that when people make a commitment, particularly a public commitment, uh, they're much more likely to exhibit that behavior. There's another piece of this that's important to recognize too is is there's also a principle in, so, in, in psychology of consistency. People really want to exhibit consistent behavior. So if you can get them to make a small commitment and then sort of ratchet up that commitment, mm -hmm. consistency sort of compels them to do something that's consistent with the initial commitment. Once you get someone to in any way identify, especially publicly, that they're engaged in some sort of pro-environmental behavior, you can then ask them for much larger commitments. Foot in the door technique. Absolutely. And it's, it's very, you know, it's very well recognized. Uh, there's a social psychologist named Robert Cialdini, who wrote a book that many of you may be familiar with called Influence. It's called Influence. It's an excellent, basically, summary of much of what is known from social psychology that's really valuable to sort of the, the field of design. So it talks about a lot of these, these principles. The book is incredibly easy to read. My final one is about, because I was really interested that you put in this, this idea of being a systems thinker in with the feedback loops, because I had really thought it in a much more simplistic way of just, just show people numbers that they'll do stuff. And about the context of like a person within a street, within a block, within a suburb, within a city, within a state. And that's kind of been what we started doing with Energy Lollipop. Like I saw the California CO2 data and I was like, wouldn't it be cool if that was just like out there really big to see? And then you think, well, I thought, well, if it's like a town, they're not going to really get into it. They just want a town, right? And then a house wants a house. And so you end up with this like layers, kind of like Russian doll layers of data, of everything fitting. It's the same data stream, CO2 intensity or whatever, but like a doll within a doll within a doll within a doll. I mean, how important is it that you think we need in terms of designing these, um, these interfaces and these kind of models of sustainability to get out of this very reductive um, maybe not reductive isn't the right word, but just individualistic type of showing people data 
and showing people the way the sort of Russian dolls of them all fitting together. Um, but just because I show people these big signs, designs that I do all the time, and every second person, at least 50% tells me they're not going to motivate people because they don't show people's individual action. And I personally don't think that's true. Since we started the Energy Lollipop app, Nico and I, even though it shows all of California, we're like, oh my God, we can't use energy at nighttime anymore. You know, it really is motivating to see the whole state. And I personally think people would be motivated by their own town and their own, their own state. It's just kind of never been done before in this big public orb sort of way. So nobody really knows. Um, anyway, that was a lot of a jambled question, but there you go, John, what do you think? <laughs> um, I, 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 I like the way you're thinking about it. Yeah, I do. I, I, I personally think having people contextualize how they fit into a larger community is absolutely central to, um, to addressing, you know, climate scale problems. So yeah, I think it's not sufficient to just show what their, what their immediate is. I mean, you know, obviously there's a balance here because if you show large scale data, people don't have that much direct influence over that large scale data, but I think contextualizing their smaller scale data in terms of the larger scale data so that they understand the way in which their individual actions are contributing to a larger whole is critical. I mean, you know, the old saying, think globally, act locally, is really sort of, I think, part and parcel to what we're, what we're trying to communicate here, that you have to you have to, or uh, Betty Friedan, who said the personal is political. I think making that connection between, you know, the individual and the collective is at some level what's missing in our society right now. We've got so much emphasis on the individual, and I think the individual needs to be situated in that larger community context if we're going to solve, you know, the scale of problems that we need to solve. Since reading it, I really started to think, you know, is everything I'm doing showing these layers? Are they showing this? I can't think of anything. Someone mentioned on Twitter, that it was like Inception, you know, that movie about the dream within a dream within a dream. It's like yeah. of better ways to show that and better ways to connect that thread between the individual and the kind of big and all the different layers underneath. Thanks so much, John. We should catch up another time and chat about yes, all this stuff. I'd love to do that. Love to do um, that. Thanks right. so thanks much, for, John. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here thanks with us. Everyone, Take care. All right. What a fascinating and awesome episode. This type of design really is in its infancy and it's a really, really exciting place to work in. I was so excited to interview John because we're using all of these design techniques in energy lollipop. Real-time feedback, competition and gamification and also the ambient display of colour. You can follow John's work at environmentaldashboard.com and Google John Peterson Oberlin College if you want to get his contact details from the university page. And please check out the blog article and the Instagram video I made that summarizes this episode. If you haven't already, install the Energy Lollipop Chrome extension that shows you the real-time carbon emissions data of the California grid. You can just type in energy lollipop chrome extension into google and it's just a one click to install it you can also sign up to our website at energylollipop.com we're also getting a round shaped public outdoor light that will be ready soon so have a look at the instagram page it's just at energy lollipop there's a video of it there and send me a message if you'd like to pilot one in your city i'll be touring it around once it arrives Please share this episode with anyone you know who designs environmental change programs or startups. We need to get the message out there that this type of design works. And of course, please consider supporting the podcast on Patreon. If you can chip in $5, 10 $25 a month, it really helps me to be able to keep on making these episodes. And don't forget to sign up to my website, katiepatrick.com. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. I'm posting ideas and research and tutorials all the time. And if you haven't already, grab a copy of my book, How to Save the World on Amazon Audible. It's also on Indiegogo. It's all about how to apply this type of gamification of environmental data to changing the world. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next month.